gracias por la invitación a, a, a estar aquí una semana en el, en el instituto eh, para hacer esta charla, la charla que, que voy a hacer en la tarde. En la, en la charla de la mañana voy a hablar en el, de dispersión e impacto de TEFRA en supererupciones, pero pienso que para vosotros que es mejor que voy a hablar en inglés. Sí, decía, es mejor que voy a hablar en inglés porque no conozco todos los términos, términos técnicos en castellano. Um, I'm starting in English then, I don't know. Uh, if you have a problem, I can uh, try to, to switch to French. Um, I will start uh, this uh, talk giving a brief introduction to explosive volcanism for people who are not familiar with but trivial. Um, uh, a couple of slides on that. Then I will talk. Uh, I will focus a bit more on the, pro on the problem of uh, tephra dispersal, and in particular the modeling uh, approach we use. Modeling uh, to do to, to And then I will um, try to explain why classical classical approach that are typically used to model the tephra. I'm going to to explain what classical approach is for um, for this kind of data. It cannot be applied to uh, super eruption. And I will um, describe this um, uh, presenting the results we obtained in modeling the companion in bright eruption. This is uh, the largest eruption occurred in Europe in the last 200,000 years and then uh, spend a few slides on describing the impact and the implication of this eruption. And then I will pass from this uh, relatively small eruption to the description of the progress that is uh, related with the, the description of uh, the largest, one of the largest uh, super eruptions we know, that is the Young Tob uh, Tough eruption. And then we we'll give some conclusions. The true volcanoes uh, I mentioned, I'm going to talk about, it, uh, are located in Italy, one in Italy and one in uh, Indonesia, that are quite uh, active areas of the earth that um, host several volcanoes, a countless number in the case of Indonesia. This is our volcanoes that erupted in the last, uh, one, uh, last century, and this is our, and this, uh, the volcanoes that are active in Italy, both um, Sub-aerial, submarine. As uh, you know, I mean, eruption types are of two types. We have extrusive and explosive eruption. Extrusive, I mean, what the tide, what dictates the kind of style of an eruption is basically what happens inside the conduit. And uh, is, uh, if we have uh, a right magma rise without fragmentation, the magma can, rise, can reach the surface as uh, uh, fluid melts can form lava flows, as we will see, or when it's very viscous, can form a lava dome. On the other hand, when as magma rises, the pressurizing form bubble, magma, there is condition where the magma can ferment and form a, a dispersal, a, a mixture of gas particles, that then can reach the surface, become buoyant, and form the eruption column. This is uh, what uh, a, a fused eruption looks like. In this case, bubble are the, the magma is suspended as uh, lava foot. <laughs> that this is what you observed on this um, on this animation. This is the results of a month of uh, assemblage of uh, different photographs. And then we have obviously what we are interested on, the case, uh, sorry, okay. the uh, formation of explosive uh, of a uh, buoyant column that can become buoyant, can reach uh, um, high level in the atmosphere. And uh, the style of this eruption is quite different because, uh, I mean, we can have uh, from um, activity that uh, Column that go from uh, Strombolian to to Plinian or Plinian eruption. I will, I will uh, spend a few, a couple of slides on the description of uh, the column in the case of a spare eruption because it's pivotal when we model it. And obviously, change span a lot also in terms of uh, 
of a volume that uh, a volcano can erupt. Here we have a, a proportional, each of these circles proportion to the volume, dense rock equivalent of the eruption of each of these eruptions. So you can see that uh, the focus of this the companion you try to follow the these are gigantic events drastically and explosive each each phenomenon that we go to the eruption of the a different impact. and this impact can affect different areas from uh, very proximal uh, of large blocks that are ejected at the side to lateral blast that's typical density paraclass is for the stars. The arts are the mobilization of material that are erupted that are not strictly intensely protected with the volcanic structure. With the eruption, and the eruption can reach up to hundreds of the same depth, up to thousands of eruption. And then we have aerosol that they can be can have a global impact. The ejected material that is no associated with depending on the size, the name, the of it, the setting below control the residence time and the atmosphere. So the residence time in the atmosphere will, will um, tell us which is the area that can impact this uh, phenomenon. And we go from bomber blocks that are represent an hazard to up to a few kilometers at most, so it's proximal, to a big touch can affect an area up to hundreds of kilometers. This is a very represent serious uh, hazard because it's uh, where most of the tephra can, uh, can accumulate and uh, produce even a roof, colla roof collapse. In this case, there is some observation and the dispersion of the tephra can from a station If you want to the entire spectrum that is ejected to the eruption, we need to use, uh, and that describe also the, the transport of fine ash, we need to use essentially medical models. The conditions that are used to, for analytical uh, models are no longer valid. You know quite well the impact of uh, uh, damage human safety because as we may, I mentioned before roof collapse or uh, road traffic disruption or you remember when the corruption uh, produced uh, more than one billion of uh, laws because uh, the, the effect of ash on the engine over the aircraft and then also the ash effect human health in the uh, respiratory system or affect the life culture, not all general ecosystems. And another effect as uh, we know it's uh, we know <coughs> as can corruption can have the composition of the the high at stratosphere because the, the the volcanic get altered. It is reactive OH form H4, and this is uh, alter the albedo 
itself and uh, and contributes to to the atmospheric cooling, the global cooling. Moreover, there are other products like fluorine and chlorine that can also impact have a, a, a um, um, strong impact on the ecosystem, especially chlorine because production of acid rain and the fluorine because fluorine that is contained in the ash accumulates ground that can produce. Uh, can impact the vegetation and produce fluorosis okay, for uh, animals that eat such kind of uh, vegetation. So, how we describe the, this kind of uh, process? And to describe this kind of process, we need, I mean, dispersal, we need some inputs. The most obvious is the vent location where the then we need to know the meteorological, we need some information about the meteorological data. In the case of, um, of numerical models, means we need to know which is the wind field, the wind temperature, the temperature, or the meteorological variables. And then we need what are the volcanological inputs that are necessary to describe the system. As men I mentioned before, we need to know the column height and the way the geometry of this. Uh, or option. The way in which the mass is distributed within the column. And then uh, the most, uh, one of the most important ones is uh, the mass eruption rate. We need to know the amount of mass that is ejected per, per unit of time to volume. And it's not enough because we need to know how it's uh, associated to each bin, each, each granulometric class. So we need information on the total eruption rate. We need to know the granulometry, the distribution of the fraction that is associated to each of this class, where he here present the diameter, it's uh, related to the diameter. And finally, we need the duration. As I said before, for these categories that um, deposit in the first hundreds of kilometers, we can use simplified model, like analytical models, Whereas, if we want to describe the entire spectrum, or we are interested in the fate of ash or lapilli on long range, we need to use numerical models. One of the numerical models I developed is called Fulcher D, and for example, for describing the eruption column, the model can use, uh, it has uh, a few options. One, the simplest is to use uh, to describe uh, the source as a point source. Another one is to describe the source empirically using this uh, kind of, uh, spray, uh, of relations that give you the shape, empirically the shape, depending how do you change this parameter A and parameter lambda, H is the column height, this can give you... So what we do usually is uh, to try to best fit the, the deposit the, field, the, the observer deposit and match which is the best spectral lambda that the kind of deposit. This is uh, an empirical way to, do, to, to proceed, but it's useful when we don't know the exact mechanism that the exact kind of a column um, is associated with the corruption we study. We study. Another more, bit more sophisticated approach is to use model based on buoyant plume theory that are, are um, um, solve basically equation um, assuming that uh, we have um, control volume, uh, cylindrical control volume and uh, imposing the mass conservation for each of this uh, 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 volume. Concerning the, geom the meteorology, uh, I forgot to say, this, uh, to say this before, Fulcher D is an Eulerian model. This is a uh, solve the advection diffusion sedimentation equation on a terrain following grid using a fine difference uh, scheme. And from a meteorological point of view, it, use, um, um, it can use um, different kind of uh, models from uh, that go from global scale synoptic to um, urban scale with resolution of one kilometer. The way in which it does is uh, just taking one of these, uh, of these, um, depending on uh, one of the different meteorological models, is uh, translated in the in the kind of inter uh, database that is uh, needed by Fulcher D using a preprocessor, 
and depending away so thanks to this interface we can use we can exploit this kind of interface to use different kind of meteorological models so and uh, concerning the other uh, the, the other um, eruption parameter that I I mentioned here before eruption column height vertical distribution total mass eruption rate granulometry usually the classical approach consists in a, in a optimization in solving an inverse problem this inverse problem consists in uh, starting from the observed ice mass maps or ice packs then uh, Try with one of the analytical model. Uh, typically, it can be anyone. I mean, as map the two ash pole. These are different example of analytical models. These kind of models are very fast. From a computational view, are very efficient. So you can do hundreds, thousand, several thousand of uh, simulation, and then f choose the best the, the the combination of parameters that best represent reproduce the, the observation. In this way, you can estimate the rapid mass. This is an uh, approach here. I released a few papers that uh, use this approach. Here is an example I uh, did for Camp Fregray. This is a small eruption. It's a relatively small eruption. It's um, about one, uh, I think this is uh, Astron. It's less than a cubic kilometer. But uh, why this approach cannot be used for super eruptions? Because uh, to model super eruption, it's um, we have. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's much more challenging. It's much more challenging because deposits are very widespread. Here, I, I reported a couple of examples. Here is a, 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 there are a few deposits associated with a Yellowstone eruption, with Yellowstone caldera, and you can see that the ice mass cover the entire U.S. And here is the top one. This is what I mean. These are different curves depending how people recognize that the different deposits are associated with the top. The the um, the limits of the eruption moved. It doesn't mean that the eruption growth from eight to two thousand. But uh, you can see that the, it cover an entire region of the world, a huge region of the world. In this case, you cannot. Assume that the wind is uh, uniform or is constant. So you need uh, the three-dimensional wind field to describe the dispersal in a region like this. Moreover, the, the, um, the deposits are very uncertain because they are eroded or reworked, and it's uh, often a scattered all in few points. So you need hundreds, at least several tens or hundreds of uh, observation to try to constrain your problem. And also you need um, to describe, to be able to describe the source, as I mentioned before. And in the case of super eruption, we have uh, two kind of possible um, column, and as I will uh, show soon. One is obviously is, uh, an er a plinian eruption. A plinian eruption looks like this. It's uh, a buoyant column that is uh, uh, composed of three regions, a gas trust region. It's where the momentum prevails. Then we have convective trust where, uh, region, a convective region where the air is enchained to become, is uh, heated and become lighter than the surrounding air and uh, become buoyant and reach a uh, level where the density is uh, it's the same than, um, than, than, the, than the surrounding atmosphere. This is called the neutral buoyancy level. And obviously, because its momentum can, can uh, overcome the neutral buoyancy level, and this has implication, as I will show later, for um, super eruption. But this, con this kind of eruption cannot be always uh, um, sustained because you need to match some criteria to 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 have this kind of buoyant column. And here in this plot, show it's a schematic one, it's a sketch. Here you have the crater size, and here the mass eruption rate. And you can see that if, for example, you in this region is the region where you can have a, a buoyant eruption column, like the one I described before. But if you increase the crater size, the column can collapse because you are not anymore in the condition for having a buoyant column. Or you can 
even increase the eruption rate, mass eruption rate, and even in this case the column will collapse. And this is, for example, there is evidence that in the case of Campanian in Bright, the eruption start does, uh, um, there is the field evidence that the eruption starts as uh, a plinian and then collapse it and form a Daconimbrat column that I will go to describe soon. And if we can have a condition where we cannot sustain eruption, um, we cannot sustain buoyant eruption column in a, in a super eruption like the one that were, were um, um, found in, in studied in Mexico, for example, this is just a, a, a um, an example of the paper by Aguirre and Labart in Sierra Madre Occidental. In this case, they propose that is a fissure eruption that uh, where, where in the deposit show that there is the presence of uh, only of a conimbrite, no eruption column. And uh, we we try to study when you can have this kind of a condition. And as they suggested, that the key ingredients, the key uh, point is that can uh, sustain uh, this kind of uh, fissure eruption, and uh, that it's, if you have a fissure eruption, means you can sustain a large mass flow rate. Is uh, the control of the extensional st uh, stress, and we try to model this, and we found that uh, you have a condition in which uh, you can sustain large. Mass eruption rate because uh, because the effect of of uh, of, uh, of the far field stress and this allow you to to have depending on the on the dike width and dike length you can sustain a very large mass eruption rate as function of different far field stress and that you can reach up to ten to the uh, more than ten uh, a few times ten to the ten. This is means that in this case you have a mass, a large ma ma mass flow rate is so large that you cannot sustain any buoyant column. Or the other thing you can sustain is a, a conium bright eruption column that is you originate uh, a pyroclastic flows. Then you can reach condition in which this can become buoyant and rise rise uh, like uh, up, up to the stratosphere because of the buoyancy. And this is uh, what I said I mentioned before. It seems what uh, it happened uh, in the case of a Campfire Gray, in the case of a uh, Nimbrite, uh, sorry, Campanian Nimbrite in Campfire Gray. Campfire Gray is um, a nested caldera that was formed by two major uh, eruptions. One uh, that occurred, uh, one is the one, uh, the, the topic, uh, one of the topic of this talk. This is a Campanian Nimbrite that occurred 59,000 years. And another stuff was produced about 15,000 15, years. 15,000 years. This is the Neapolitan yellow tuff. And this, uh, the Campanian in Bright in particular, was the largest that occurred in Europe in the last 200,000 years. This um, deposit associated with this eruption were studied since uh, the 80s, and it was. Um, um, an attempt to try to quantify the volume associated with that. This is uh, the work, uh, it's um, a, gra a plot, a graph, from uh, the work of Cornel et al. That is a pivotal uh, work, a seminal paper that uh, try to, uh, to quantify the effect of uh, aggregation for uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, deposits. And they show that uh, if you don't have uh, invoke the presence of aggregates, you cannot reproduce uh, the deposit in both in terms of thickness and in terms of uh, granulometric, uh, granulometric features. Obviously, in the 80s, the computational power was, um, was quite limited, but they, they performed some simulation to try to, to describe the um, observed deposit. And uh, since at that time, most of the data were available only in the Mediterranean Sea. They described only us of the real um, extension. Then with time, because we are in Europe, and then there are a lot of, uh, of um, archaeological sites that uh, identified where, where archaeologists and volcanologists identified the deposit associated with the Campanian in Bright. People realized that the extension of this eruption was much, much um, widespread. In this, um, in this case, I mean, 
it um, was a challenge to try to to describe the mechanism and the way in which this uh, uh, the, this um, inebriate was dispersed, this tephra was dispersed. And here you can see uh, this is quite recent uh, paper. They, this is our the hypothetical limits over the over the inebriate. And here are associated the, the thickness that are um, associated with this eruption. This, I forgot to say that this eruption is um, very relevant also from archaeological point of view. It's called, in archaeology it's called, in technology in general, it's called the y, Y5 level. It is uh, an important uh, temporal marker. So it's uh, used by archaeologists to to date and, and the rate their dating uh, during the data excavations. So it's the reason for which there are all this uh, um, interest and all uh, the, and, and all this amount, large amount of data were available. And another important feature is that um, in Russia, that is uh, a f quite a few thousand kilometers from the source, they found in Kostiansky up to two centimeters of ash associated with this eruption. So this was uh, was um, a challenge for um, volcanological community to, to, uh, for the volcanological community to try to de to describe this kind of dispersal. Uh, we proposed uh, a couple of years ago this kind of methodology that uh, the methodology I'm going to explain in this slide. Basically, we started. Um, we used a, a data set of three-dimensional time-dependent meteorological fields across the region of interest. That in this case, go it's more or less go from uh, from Italy up to Russia, and from Russia to the South Mediterranean, Mediterranean area. And in combination with a range of chronological inputs per meter, different combination of mass eruption rate, duration, column height, total grand size distribution. At the beginning, we we gave some interval, and the first guess for the intervals was based on the previous estimate of the literature, minimum and maximum estimate of each of one of these. Or to be more cautelative, we we enlarge the, the, the range for each of these parameters. These were used with, um, we, we performed the five hundreds, hundreds of simulation, 500 simulation with uh, using the false D model that I described before on a cluster, a computer cluster in Barcelona with her now folk, this on the Mare Nostrum. And we then, uh, we, we, we choose the best fitting, uh, the, 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 um, value that best represents the observation using this stepwise strategy. On the first step, we we use the only one class for computational re reason. We use the most effective class, that means the class we knew we knew that uh, could reach distant location, like for example Kostiansky in Russia. And with this one single class, we, we performed the 500 simulation and using a relatively coarse mesh. This allowed us to, to speed up the process. Then we, we excluded all the simulation that were clearly incompatible with observation, with the deposit. For example, if we found a um, deposit that go in the opposite direction, instead to go to Russia, go, go, to, go to France, we excluded all this kind of, uh, of uh, simulations. Then we restricted to the more the, the compatible meteorological fields that were almost 300, and then we sampled, the, we, we, we performed the other 100, 300 simulation in combination with different volcanological parameters, sampled randomly from the distributor, the, the, the distribution we assumed before, a priori. Then we selected the 10 best cases, and we refined the search of the volcanological par parameters using the same resolution that is half than the previous one. Then in the final step, we kept the two best cases and the future refined, we used the final resolution and future refined the search of the volcanological parameters. This uh, allowed us to obtain a quite uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable um, description of the deposit with uh, 
most the 90% of the of the observation were within a factor five of the model simulation. And consider that the uncertainty related with observation is still high because most of the deposits were reworked or or um, eroded. So we we assumed that both uncertainty related with the modeling and uncertainty related with the observation were was compatible and we could give estimation for the best best uh, parameter best guess parameters and we found that the volume associated with this eruption i mean with the only the one associated with the Tefra one with, with the Tefra deposit was most, more than double than the previous estimates in particular we we estimated a volume of uh, between 250 to 300 cubic kilometers of Tefra that uh, it's uh, it's almost 100, more than 100 um, uh, cubic kilometer in dense rock equivalent. And in, in terms of duration, we estimated a few days, from two to four. And in terms of mass eruption rate, we estimate some things between 10 to the, close to 10 to the 9. That is quite reasonable. And we were good to give the estimation, also estimate the, um, the column shape that indicates that most of the mass was concentrated on the top, that is not common for uh, for a plinian eruption, where the mass is, uh, is concentrated mainly at three quarts of the eruption column. But this is uh, not a really description of the eruption column, because it's an empirical way, as I, sh as you I showed it before, to describe the source. This means that it's likely we, we, we miss some process that um, in, in, in that allow us to describe properly the eruption column, and the important, most important things we were able to to, the, to reproduce the the, the isopax maps, and here are the true best cases, the, the the best case and the second best cases, and here it's the isopax maps in terms of thickness in centimeters. And you can see here, you can reach two centimeters, five centimeters uh, all around. This is an uh, important implication because uh, we were able to, uh, together with the volume associated to the ash, we were able, uh, from the magma composition, we estimated the amount of uh, volatiles, basically SO2, that was uh, injected directly in the stratosphere. And we estimated that uh, up about 200 teragram of uh, sulfur was injected directly in the stratosphere, and for uh, almost 500 teragram in total. This would have caused a volcanic winter producing a, a one true degrees of uh, global co cooling for a couple of years. Well, obviously, this is uh, global cooling. Global cooling for a couple of years it doesn't mean that uh, we, we can uh, easily have a region in the world where the temperature can drop much more, could drop much more than a couple of degrees, up to a few or so tens of degrees, ten degrees in the middle latitude. And this uh, volcanic winter would have uh, happened during the enrichment four, that is the coldest and driest climatic episode of the last glacial period. And Moreover, in terms of impact on the ecosystem, we were able to estimate the amount of fluorine that was uh, released during this eruption. That um, it's between 100 and 300 teragram of what we estimated, and this would uh, produce acid, ra acid rain that would would have a future effect, the food source, and uh, severely impacted the. the Group, human groups that were living uh, the, in that area, that period, that were mainly concentrated along the coast. This um, what and um, another uh, another things uh, the fl fluorine that uh, I said this the fluorine would have uh, produced the affect the vegetation and the, from the vegetation would affect the the an, an animal population that were present at, at that time. This, uh, what we presented is basically the potential impact on the ecosystem, but uh, we were surprised the, from um, the e eco that the, the study had uh, in the literature, in the, in the press, uh, as I will show later. This is because uh, this eruption, apart to be um, an important stratigraphic marker, 
is also associated that there are in anthropologists there are a couple of schools there are schools that thinks there are a school that is uh, simplify maybe too much and uh, claims that this eruption was the killer of the Neanderthal other schools say that they didn't have uh, any impact on Neanderthal but um, what uh, for sure the eruption had an impact on the ecosystem and uh, it's uh, related it's, there is some correlation with the presence of Neanderthal in the areas where there are the um, deposit imp impacted more and uh, you can see here is the distribution of the Neanderthal population around Europe here before the eruption and here during the eruption soon after and you can see that even if we don't believe anything I mean of these theories of anthropologists you, there is a clear evidence that uh, at the time of the eruption that more or less was here to 9,000 years there was an acceleration of a process that uh, was already going on and uh, we think it was this uh, the reason for which the, the, the st our study attracted the, um, the attention of the press a part of the paper was highlighted the, in EOS then uh, there was articles in uh, li English language French liter French uh, press, uh, Italian obviously, and German, and now it's uh, um, an American uh, uh, house production of a documentary that is it is going to start to do a documentary on that, basically exploring and interviewing several people, different people from volcanologists, anthropologists, to see which is. Um, to do present which could be the potential impact of um, the companion in bright on the human on the uh, on the neanderthal and sub and the homo sapiens population that were inhabited at that time in europe now i'm going to talk of another controversial eruption that is some work we start to do this it's a uh, a different scale it's much larger it's more than order of magnitude larger than the eruption i was talking about of the companion in bright, that is the young top batas. I say that there is even here quite controversial debate on the pact of uh, this eruption with uh, human uh, evolution, because uh, there are quite a few studies that um, link the this eruption to the bottleneck in human evolution. There are obviously other studies, uh, studies that negate there is this. So this means this is quite controversial topic and this uh, was quite um, I would say fashionable um, maybe 10 years ago because first estimates that they was were done on the impact of this eruption on climate were quite drastic a bit they overestimate the 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 impact probably they overestimate the the impact uh, of the volcanic eruption on uh, on climate on and atmosphere in general because recent study made with uh, computational um, uh, climatic model with uh, climatology uh, model suggests a relatively short temperature response of the order of uh, ten years before was claimed up to hundreds and a weaker cooling um, up to four degrees as maximum global uh, cooling maximum global cooling and with peaks of uh, 10 degrees in some uh, middle latitude uh, regions the reason for which this impact uh, was weaker is because we know a bit more about the um, the um, dynamic of aerosol of volcanic aerosol that 10 years, uh, 20 years ago was uh, not clear. In this uh, plot, in this graph here, in this uh, figure here, you can see the points where this uh, eruption, this deposit was recognized. And you can see that is the area that impacted is a huge range from uh, the South China Sea, where were measured up to two centimeters up to the Lake Malawi in Africa that uh, recently they found the microtephra even here and just to give you the order of this eruption over this distance this is more than 7,000 kilometers from the source and, but what is more impressive in this um, what would represent the challenge to model this eruption is uh, these points that are up, upwind 
are more than 1,000 1, or more kilometers from the source. So we need to find a mechanism that um, uh, we need to, I mean, to account for the mechanism that can, uh, can, can uh, that is able to to do, to do this kind of transport upwind. We studied the, this uh, deposit using um, this eruption using a very simplified model. And this was done a couple of years ago in a paper I appeared uh, yeah, two years ago, using a very simplified approach just to estimate the volume. And we were able to obtain a more or less a reasonable, a reasonable fit. But there were some things we needed. We had to force the model in order to reproduce uh, this kind of uh, ice packs. In particular, we needed the, uh, the apparent diffusion coefficient larger than 10 to the 7, that is more than order, mag more than order of magnitude, even true, from uh, what we estimate from the normal atmospheric turbulence. So this means that it's clear, uh, differently from the companion in bright, that um, there are other mechanisms that we don't account if we, if we don't consider the proper physics. In this case, it's um, what it's uh, likely to be responsible of this behavior and displaying this huge apparent diffusion coefficient is uh, the gravity current e effect that occur at the neutral buoyancy level. When the eruption reached the neutral buoyancy level, it has still, when, when the, sorry, the mixture reached the uh, buoyancy level, it has still some, some, some momentum and the rise up, up, up to uh, when the, the velocity is, uh, is b become zero, then collapse and form a gravity spreading current around the neutral buoyancy level. And the larger is the eruption rate, the volumetric eruption rate at the buoyancy level, here is uh, called Q, the stronger is the effect of this kind of spreading. So there is this, uh, the radius of this, uh, of this uh, disk, I would say, in, in absence of wind, it would be just a disk. It increases with time. Analytical models suggest uh, two thirds, with a power of two thirds. But there are groups from Bristol and now are working to refine this kind of models. And maybe the power is a bit different. But uh, whatever is uh, the, 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 the exact mechanism, it has a um, pivotal effect. That if we don't account, we are not able to reproduce observations. We did this. Um, we tried to to use this simplified model, analytical model, coupled with our transport model, and applied it to pinatub eruption, for which we were available some uh, satellite observations. And uh, we found that uh, if we, you took you take into account this kind of mechanism, you can reproduce quite well uh, the observations. Whereas if you neglect it, you don't reproduce uh, observation at all, unless you force the, um, the diffusion coefficient to be much larger than what should be. And this is uh, the way in which an uh, diffusion, analytical diffusion model, di diffusion sedimentation model, a direction sedimentation model works because uh, they, instead to use uh, a real coefficient, coefficient they use uh, a, a, an apparent one that is uh, the empirical one that reproduce, best reproduce the observations. And in this uh, figure, you can see that um, the, the distance at which this uh, gravity current uh, effects are important can be of the order of a thousand of kilometers, depending on the mass eruption rate. For an eruption like uh, Companion in Bright, we said about 10 to the 9, it would affect an area up to few, few, ten, few hundreds of kilometers. So in the, it's the reason for which we knew the limitation of our, our modeling, and we excluded all the points that were closer, all the observation closer than 50 kilometers. So, but uh, to be completely sure that uh, th this uh, mechanism is uh, not important, you should uh, neglect the first hundreds of kilometers. But since uh, most than 90% of the point were uh, beyond the transit points, this would not affect our results, results I, I, 
I showed before. But in the case of uh, top eruption, if we don't account for this mechanism, it's impossible to reproduce uh, any kind of observation. And what we did is to try some preliminary results is to try to model coupling this model with, with the um, dispersal model in order to reproduce uh, the icebox maps. And we are still working on it, but we are getting quite close and uh, we were able to get less than uh, what a few millimeters of ash up to Lake Malawi in Africa and up to a few centimeters in uh, South Lake, uh, South China Sea. And this is possible only if you account for the gravity current model. And we we were able to get some reasonable agreement with observation, even if we are still working on it, and estimate the total volume. We estimated more than 2,000 cubic kilometers of dense rock equivalent associated with the tephra, with a very short duration of the order of hours. That is implied that is a huge mass eruption rate. This. Uh, pose us a another problem. How it's possible to sustain this uh, huge mass eruption rate? I mean, this is impossible to have uh, such a large mass eruption rate only from one vent. So what we suggest, what the, this result suggests is pro probably that uh, we had uh, multiple uh, vents active at the same time along uh, the fracture of, uh, of uh, Lake Toba that looks like almost a graben. So, in conclusion, I presented a, a, a computational methodology that can be used to, to describe widely dispersed, the, uh, widely dispersed tephra. This methodology consists in using a, a three-dimensional time-dependent um, meteorological field together with hundreds of observations of a tephra deposit. And the method was applied to the companion in bright that um, was the largest uh, eruption that occurred in Europe in the last 200,000 years and allowed us to quantify the key volcanological parameters and the impact of this eruption on the ecosystem at that time. This obviously, as for people who study anthropology, has some implication even for uh, population that live in Europe at that time. And we were able to describe this uh, Neglecting what the proximal, what happened, uh, the deposit, I mean, uh, well, as I explained before, the proximal deposit. But uh, when we try to apply the same method in the case of, uh, of uh, top eruption, that is uh, of uh, an order of magnitude larger, if we don't account for gravity current effects, we are not able to reproduce any kind of, uh, of um, any kind of, uh, the, of the observed deposits. This uh, work is still uh, going on, it's, on um, it's in progress, but give already quite, um, quite interesting insight. Apart the, 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 um, to, apart the, to, to real, uh, we realize that the model is able to reproduce uh, this appro the approach we use it if we account for the, the proper uh, process that, um, that um, are in the, in the that occur during this kind of of huge eruptions, we are able to reproduce the observation, but giving us insight about this mechanism that um, in order to produce uh, this kind of um, to reproduce this, the observation related with that top eruption, you need a huge mass flow rate, and this would open another problem, which were the mechanism that uh, that um, were active during the eruption. Uh, for this type of eruptions, the Coriolis force is not important for the distribution of the. Yeah, for uh, the case in the case of a top eruption, uh, it is. But um, the reason the reason for which we can, uh, in the first approximation, we uh, neglect. Uh, it's okay if you talk in English. I speak in English. Yeah. Okay. E if um, the reason for which uh, first as first approximation we can neglect is because uh, most of the dispersal occurred uh, near the equator. 
So near the equator, the corollary, it's uh, not. But uh, there are studies by Ben and Seth Sparks that show what the uh, corollary effects are some important, uh, corollary force has a very important effect in limiting the dispersal of this uh, spreading. It's act like a counterbalance in the, in, the, in the spreading of the disk. In regard to the Tova eruption and the dispersion you, sh you showed, it relies heavily on the positive identification of very distal ash, and in this case, in Malawi. So my question is, how the, what does this ash there look like, and how was it identified? I mean, definitely fingerprinted to come from Toba. That is number one of and I have a second question associated. If you are able to really fingerprint this, you will probably within the next 10 or 15 years find hundreds of <coughs> other places, um, maybe not just in Africa, but at different locations. And that would have a, would change completely the, yeah. the panorama. Yeah. I mean, the key issue is to be able to identify yeah. Definitely, this tephra, isn't it? Yeah, no. I mean, this is um, what Klaus um, is saying. It's uh, quite a philosophical problem. It's quite important. I mean, obviously, this kind of uh, simulation rely on observations. M I mean, m model themselves cannot tell you too much. If you put rubbish, rubbish in, you have rubbish out. If if the data will lie in the in the in the work other people do. If the data are not reliable, obviously our results are not, rel are not reliable too. In, in the case of Toba, I know quite well. Is um, I mean they are quite uh, they are uh, quite reliable. Obviously, bec um, what people use research used to discern if it's Toba or no, it's based on uh, on the on the ash on the composition of the glass. And there is quite clear fingerprint for for the uh, young Tobataf, but we don't know if it's um, you cannot exclude that it's uh, related with m one single event or multiple events. But from the other end, what model suggests, uh, and as I said before, in order to get these uh, few centimeters, thousand of kilometer upwind from the source. You had you, it's likely that was a single event, as people most of the people said. In the case of uh, Yellowstone, I've read uh, a few recent papers that, for example, they show that, that um, when you do a detailed uh, analysis, the deposit doesn't match. It's not only one eruption; it's likely to be associated with multiple eruptions. So volume will be much lower than uh, what was suggested uh, previously, but um, this is a quite um, good point. I mean, it's <laughs> but we, we cannot. We, it, it, it's a point that shows the importance for us to associate the uncertainty to each observation, because we, we know that we have still uncertainty for relatively. Young deposit like Colima, for example, 1913. It's uh, we still don't know if it's associated uh, to the last eruption, to the eruption before. But this um, highlights the importance to to associate the uncertainty. If we have the uncertainty, we can give an estimation with an uncertainty. The larger it is, I mean, the, the lower it is, the best it is. But it's better to give some guess. How do you account for the very fine distal ash? Because obviously, in, in your model, because obviously the isopacks, I mean the, the, <clears throat> the ones that are furthest away, as you were mentioning before, are minimum values. I mean, what kind of correction do you do or how do you include that into your model, even the, in the yeah. smaller ones? Yeah, I mean, in the case of a very distal, I mean, the only way you can um, rely on um, very thin deposit is when you have uh, natural traps. Like lakes. In the case, uh, I mean, of a companion in Bright, for example, we what we have seen that in some case, 
the observation, the, the observed thickness could be reworked larger than what had to be, because very close to that there were very thin deposits where luckily were uh, eroded. The assumption we did is that if you have hundreds, a, a large statistical number of, of observation, you are likely to compensate the bias. In some case, you overestimate, in other cases, uh, underestimate, so the model could give you the best, uh, uh, the best guess and uh, together with the best guess, the uncertainty. For example, in the case of, uh, of the volume we estimate for, um, for Companion in Bright, we estimated about 200 cubic kilometers, 250, and the uncertainty is a factor two. That means could be, it's likely could be any number between 250 to 500 and 250 to 100. You have mentioned about the youngest Obatu. Uh, couple of years ago, I was working as an intern um, on the same thing, on the Toba Tooth, and uh, as far as I know, Toba Tooth is classified into three, like lower Toba Tooth, middle, and then younger. You mean all the Tooth, uh, all the Toba Tooth, middle Tooth, no, this is only for the young one. The work I presented is uh, only for the young, to young Toba Tooth. So you have taken the age into consideration and based on that you have made the isopac maps and Yeah, only, only for uh, the isopacs, uh, only for the deposits that were related to the, the 74 years ago eruption, 74,000 years ago eruption. Okay. And not, uh, it's not, com we don't, don't account for the mid, mid uh, Tobata for all the Tobata. All the Tobata. Uh, because in Kare it all, I think, uh, he has mentioned about the shifting of the winds and multiple men, uh, wind events. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, uh, we, uh, as I told you, it's uh, some work in progress, but it's luckily, there was a shift of the vent or multiple vents active at the same time because otherwise I don't see any explanation to to support, to sustain this kind of uh, large mass flow rate in, and at the same time have eruption columns. Otherwise you should have a, a deposit similar to what we observed in uh, Sierra Madre of the Occidental in Mexico, I mean where you have a conium bright, you don't have a death fallout associated to it. Okay. And uh, uh, have you performed any sampling by yourself or you have just uh, uh, incurred the data from the previous workers? In the work I showed you before, Matthew Stahl, Matthew did the sam sampling. She was in India for a few months. Okay. They found up to four or five, uh, a couple of points where there is clear evidence that were up to four or five centimeters in India, in different locations of India. I actually come from India, so I have seen the deposits, but again, uh, in compliance to Dr. Klaus, I mean, um, I find it quite difficult to, you know, correlate the ash exactly to the Toba to yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. Thanks. In the inversion process, I guess the solution is highly non-unique. So in one example, you show two best solutions, but how do you select them and are the solutions are very, very different, for example, for uh, yeah. acceptable solutions. Yeah, I mean, for this, uh, it's, it's a good point. I mean, for this, you need the experience. I mean, it's, um, you can have a numerical solution that uh, is reproduced by non-physical value of, uh, by value of the parameters that are not physical at all. And this is the reason for which we set a, a priori the range of the parameters because if you allow all the possibility in your uh, in your dom in, in your uh, parameter space, you can have a very good fit, but maybe obten obtaining uh, parameters that are not physical at all, at all, like I don't know, unrealistic column height or uh, unrealistic uh, diffusion coefficient, as I showed before in the case of Tob. So you need you need to know the problem uh, to, to study the problem before you cannot do a priori. You need to have uh, some guess. Do you have some kind of trade-off between parameters or well-known trade-off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, we obviously we select only the independent parameters because there are other parameters that are related to each other. So. In that case, we try to use empirical correlation between the two, the, this kind of parameters to reduce the number of free parameters, adjustable parameters. 
And the, complica the complication in this case you were mentioning is that apart, besides the volcanological parameter you need to best fit, you have also the meteorological field. So this would introduce future uh, complica complications uh, and make the problem uh, even more linear. Is there is of which we say that we don't present this uh, like uh, last word, this is uh, our best guess. I have a question uh, regarding with the amount of uh, fine ash that, that remains uh, for many years after the eruption. What do you do with this uh, ash? I mean, in terms of calculations, is a significant proportion of the total volume of the eruption? And uh, if it's possible to, to estimate uh, uh, the dispersal or uh, uh, or the uh, contribution for the eruption. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, there are cases where you have a discharge that is trapped, the natural trap, like uh, for example lakes. Other cases in which uh, ash is just um, it's just preserved in the, on the ground and. Uh, with time, obviously, will compact or will be eroded or will be reworked. If uh, we, but if it's reworked or is eroded, you can find from uh, from uh, field uh, studies. You can uh, the, the field studies and the study of uh, of uh, the morphology of the deposit can can tell you if it's reworked or if it's eroded. In this case, when you have. Uh, a statistical number that compensate each other, what we assume is that the model can give you, can still give you a best case. And instead for the problem of compensation, we, we account for that, but um, we account measuring the actual deposit density and then converting the thickness in um, mass loading. I, I would like to hear your comment on the fact that there is a 25 year shift between the computer simulations that were done and reported in, in the 80s, and then 25, 25 years later, the, uh, this uh, mapping of the deposits was done. So normally it is m more or less the opposite. More or less people try to fit uh, the, the, the models to something that is known, and in this case it is the opposite. No, I mean, it's 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 same uh, it's the same i mean because work that did the 25 years ago was based on the observation available at that time was not trying to extrapolate because as i told you the computational power at that time was not so so large so uh, strong what uh, they did is they tried to simulate the observation obtained from the core um, obtained with the ships on, in the mediterranean sea and they just assumed that it was uh, the, the, the isopacks were symmetrical, then just calculate the, uh, the volume associated with that uh, half, half part of the isopacks, and then assume that it was symmetrical on the other side to give a minimum estimate. But then, with time, were observation that tell us, told us that the dispersal was very different from uh, this kind of assumption. It's still observation come before modeling. Obviously, then you can use model to, to validate, to verify if the model ver ver uh, prediction is uh, consistent or not. For example, once that we have uh, the ASPA, uh, the ASPA, we reconstruct the ASPAX maps, people that go in the field they can uh, see if there is any kind of uh, of ash that they can uh, correlate with the, uh, with the companion in bright in the same. In the case of Toba, case so Toba, for example, it's another emblematic case because the dispersal, the area that was impacted, changed drastically in the last 20 years. This is because as people get more information, more observation, more cores, and refining the kind of fingerprint methods, they were able to correlate with this with the same eruption. But it's still, I mean, it's still heavily Every, all results heavily rely on uh, observations because unfortunately we don't know I mean we, don't, we are not able to describe um, 
to de describe uh, this kind of phenomena starting from principles. Gracias, este.